So uh, good evening and uh, welcome everyone. I'm delighted to see so many people uh, joining us today. And uh, together with uh, Philipp Bernhardt and Eike Stau, we will be hosting the fifth event of the Hertie School Diplomacy Club. And uh, this evening we have a terrific panel composed of uh, five experts based in five different countries. And uh, together we will talk about the evolution of Afghanistan in the last 20 years, as well as the prospects of what might happen in the years to come. And uh, why is this a very important topic right now? Well, this year, a newly elected President Joe Biden has continued what his predecessor started with the American forces now leaving Afghanistan. And according to plans, the withdrawal of US and NATO forces is supposed to be completed before the end of 2021. And uh, this will lead to new power dynamics inside the country and the Afghan government. And the Taliban, will, uh, the Afghan government and the Taliban will have to negotiate as based on the Doha peace talks. And uh, with everything happening rapidly and as we speak, now is the perfect time to assess what impact the international intervention in Afghanistan had on the country. So what changed? Did it change for the better or did it change for the worse? What is the current state of Afghanistan and the existing power dynamics? And obviously a very central question, what are possible outcomes for Afghanistan in the years to come once the US and NATO forces withdraw? And uh, talking with us, uh, tonight, we have very um, interesting guests uh, from Afghanistan, Pakistan, the US, Russia, and Germany, even though, unfortunately, our guest from uh, Afghanistan is still facing uh, technical difficulties, but he might join us uh, very soon. And uh, so now uh, to our guests. So we'll start with uh, the, um, our guests joining us from Lahore. We have Ambassador Iqbal Khan for a Pakistani perspective. He's a former Pakistani diplomat who has served his country in various capacities for over 30 years in Pakistan's diplomatic missions abroad and at the Foreign Office in Islamabad. He currently lectures on international affairs at the Lahore University of Management Science and at various governmental institutions. Joining us from Washington, D.C., we have Ambassador Omar Samad for an American perspective. He currently is a non-resident -res senior fellow with the Atlantic Council South Asia Center in Washington, D.C., and his area of expertise are South and Central Asia, as well as U.S.-Afghanistan geopolitical and reconciliation issues. He was Afghan ambassador to France, Canada, as well as Belgium and the European Union, and he further served as a spokesperson for the Afghan Ministry of Foreign Affairs. He has gathered a lot of experience as policy advisor in several think tanks and further has experience in academic teaching. Joining us from Moscow, we have Dr. Georgi Machedice for a Russian perspective. Uh, he is an expert on international terrorism and a specialist on Afghanistan. He has been a diplomat in Turkey, Iran and Afghanistan. And he has a lot of experience in conflict management and negotiation as well as as a researcher. He has worked in expert groups on several conflicts such as in the North Caucasus and participated in inter-Tajik inter negotiation on national reconciliation in Tehran. He headed the International Security Directorate of the Apparatus of the Security Council of the Russian Federation and was Secretary of the Interdepartmental Commission on International Security. Uh, now, uh, we also have joining from Berlin, Andreas Krüger for a German perspective. He is the head of the Department for Afghanistan and Pakistan of the German Foreign Ministry. He is responsible for bilateral and uh, European Union relation to both countries. Furthermore, he coordinates German policies in the region and is responsible for relationship to the German parliament. Mr. Krüger is deputy representative of the German federal government for Afghanistan and Pakistan, and he previously led the departments for Lebanon and Syria in the foreign ministry. Uh, now to our guest who might join us later on uh, from Kabul, we have Mushtaq Rahim for an Afghan perspective. Uh, he's a political and security analyst as well as post-conflict development practitioner. His focus lays on conflict, peace and security, as well as reforms in the security sector. He has been working in Afghanistan for the last 16 years, and uh, he has worked for Care International in Afghanistan, UNDP, and the Afghan government at the High Peace Council's Executive Secretariat for Peace and Reconciliation Process. So thank you very much to our guests for joining us, but also to our viewers. And uh, with our exceptional guests, we will focus on four core, uh, four core topics about Afghanistan. So first, we will try to evaluate the last 20 years and assess if these can be seen as a success or as a failure. Then we will talk about the prospects of including the Taliban in the government. 
Afterwards, we will continue with the influence of Pakistan, Iran, and India in the country. Finally, we will conclude by talking about the future of the Afghan state. Will it have a central government, a, war a warlord dynamics, or maybe even something else? And uh, at the end of our discussion, we will have a Q&A session for about 30 minutes, during which you will be able to ask your questions uh, to our panelists. So if you have questions, keep them in mind. And towards the end, uh, we will call on you for you to ask them. And so now uh, let's jump right into the core of the topic and start our discussion. And for this, I'm handing over to Philip, who will moderate. Thank you, Lucas, uh, Ambassador Samad, uh, Ambassador Khan, uh, Mr. Machiditsi, Mr. Rahim, and Mr. Kruger. It is my pleasure to moderate today's panel. Uh, but before we start right away, um, I just uh, got the information from Mushtaq Rahim from Kabul that he is still not here. Um, but I see he is joining right now. So please give me one more minute and we'll start immediately. <coughs> Doug? Hi, um, good afternoon, good evening, uh, maybe good morning, depending wherever you are. Yes, I'm with you guys. Good to see you all. Perfect. Thank you very much. Um, I just uh, started um, and we have already introduced all the panelists tonight. Um, uh, so let me start with my first question to uh, Ambassador Samad. Um, now that uh, President Biden continued the course that his predecessor, former President Donald Trump, initiated, American forces will leave Afghanistan on 9-11, which is ex exactly 20 years after the attacks that everybody knows, uh, with NATO following closely uh, behind. Are U.S. forces leaving as winners or losers, and why? You are in mute, Mr. Samad. Thank you so much, uh, Philip and Lucas and the HSDC for this invitation uh, and tough questions that you have lined up. Um, first of all, I, I, let me just say that the Americans have said that they will be leaving by September 11th. Uh, there is an anticipation that they might leave before that, that they might complete the withdrawal before that, and that even NATO might complete the withdrawal. What form and shape it's going to take, we don't exactly know yet. They're working on it. It has already started. And then what form and shape the future relationship with the US and NATO is going to take is also being discussed right now. Uh, so there is a possibility that if the political process, trying to find a political settlement for Afghanistan uh, moves in the right direction, then uh, there is a chance that uh, at, at some transition might occur. And that during this transition and beyond that, uh, there still might be uh, some type of U.S., NATO, uh, EU, and other uh, kinds of uh, involvement and engagement with Afghanistan, especially in terms of um, uh, aid and assistance. Now, as far as your question is concerned, I think it's a mixed bag. I'll be very honest. I think that part of the mission has been accomplished. The initial mission post 9-11 was uh, initially to convince the Taliban to hand over al-Qaeda and its leaders to the U.S. They didn't for their own reason at the time. And the U.S. decided to intervene and NATO intervened. Since then, 20 years have elapsed. Uh, we, you know, I was one of the very first Afghans to go back and try to serve and uh, help rebuild my country in December of 2001. So I was there on the ground from the very beginning. I saw uh, what happened and how we started that process. That process started off fairly well. Uh, there was a lot of goodwill. There was a lot of optimism. Uh, and people felt liberated uh, after many years. And they thought that this was the end of conflict in Afghanistan. The big mistake was that we, had not, we did not have a comprehensive political settlement solution to the problem. The Taliban were defeated. We thought that they would not come back. But two, three years down the road, the Taliban reemerged uh, from their sanctuaries outside Afghanistan, but also from within Afghanistan. They uh, also used some of the dissatisfaction of the Afghan public uh, towards governance, towards corruption, towards violence, uh, towards injustice. And over the years, they built up on that. And they, uh, I think the Taliban were able to 
not only manipulate but also invest in that in that so from that point of view i think that the overall mission failed to fully comprehend afghanistan grasp mm -hmm. what is going on and to uh, to address the issues that the afghan people had not only in kabul you see the focus was so much on kabul in a few communities in kabul those who were connected those who spoke english or any other language those who came from the outside there was so much money that over time came into the country that i think uh, part of the rural afghanistan was forgotten or it was misunderstood and at times it was mismanaged and mishandled and we i think ended up hurting some of the afghan people and that in in my opinion is a failure uh corruption dealing with corruption is a failure uh, mismanagement is a failure uh i think that um uh, there are other things like counterterrorism which to some extent is a success i think that fighting narcotics is a failure uh, at the same time uh, you know giving the afghan people a chance to access to education and health is mostly positive and a success I think that building some infrastructure is a success, but we have a very weak economy, a very fragile economy, independent. So we are not at the level where Afghanistan can be self-sustainable. Okay, let me. So just... it's a mixed bag of um, success and failure, uh, and I think 20 years is a very long time. And at the end of it, we have to find a solution. Very important last sentence. Uh, we realized at a certain point that war is not the solution to the afghan problem more military uh, means to try to control everything is not the way because tens of thousands of people have died in the process uh, and we are and the afghan people are becoming frustrated uh, so the only solution left realizing that the taliban are also a reality of afghanistan is to seek a political settlement and take the negotiating Thank you very much. That's already a pretty good um, introduction for the next uh, question. Um, uh, Ambassador Khan, um, the uh, Pakistani Foreign Minister Shah Mahmoud Qureshi has said that the Doha agreement would have not happened without Pakistan. Looking at the 20 past years, why did Pakistan decide to broker this deal now and not before? And how does this connect to what Ambassador Samad just said? Okay, thank you very much, uh, Philip. You know, right from the very beginning, right from 2002, Pakistan actually has been advocating that there should be a reconciliation. When the United States, with the massive invasion, they were able to practically annihilate the Taliban. That was the time. That was 2002, when Pakistan and the others advised the United States, this is the ideal time to get the Taliban on board. The majority of the Taliban are moderate. They want to reconcile and come into the Afghan mainstream. Unfortunately, it's a question of hubris. The United States, as well as the Afghan government, both of them rejected this idea. They said the Taliban now are a totally spent force. This is acknowledged by the then CIA director who was based in Islamabad, but looking after uh, Afghanistan as well. He has written a book. And in the book, he has again said that this, unfortunately, has been a blind spot. That had we at that time accepted the Taliban, the Taliban would have, the hardliners, would have lost the support of the majority of Taliban. In fact, the foreign minister of Taliban, Ahmad Mutawakkil, he came to, the, U, to uh, uh, the U.S. authorities with all these proposals 
and with a lot of other Taliban leaders. And in return, he was arrested and put behind bars for two years. So it is not factually correct. All throughout, Pakistan has been maintaining there is no military solution to the war in uh, Afghanistan. They are telling even now all the players, and this include the Taliban, don't think through a military assault, you might be able to get some temporary victories. But if you truly want to have a sustainable peace, you have the welfare, the well-being of the Afghan people at heart, you have to give and take. Let there be a reconciliation. It is good for you. It is good for the region. It is good for the world. So Pakistan then, Pakistan later, Pakistan now, as you said, the foreign minister had said, has continuing to play a role to facilitate wherever we have influence, people to come together to reconcil uh, reconciliate, to get into a dialogue, to give and take, so that there is ultimately a broad-based government in Afghanistan, where at least most of the players have a stake. This, I think, Pakistan believes, I'm no spokesman of the government of Pakistan, but to me, this is what makes sense. It did not make sense then for the Americans to spurn the Taliban. It does not make sense now for the Taliban to spurn anybody else. Perfect. Um, Mr. Machitice, um, informally, um, the president of the Russian Federation, uh, Putin, uh, instructed Russian forces when uh, the NATO coalition entered Afghanistan in 2001 to support the Americans in everything they do with everything they have. Is this still the case? <coughs> How does uh, the Russian posi position deviating from their past course, especially in relation to uh, the American interest and the American way of approaching the Afghan problem, have changed um, for the Russian perspective today? Uh, no, as you know, uh, uh, thank you for the question. And as, as you know, Russia uh, supported for the first period time, Russia supported the United States. Uh, just, uh, you know, uh, troops, some troops uh, were coming through the Russian territory to Afghanistan, some military equipment also. So uh, it, it continued for, for a long time. Uh, uh, um, as to the now, now Russia tries to, uh, to use some different formats uh, just to, to help to support a uh, peace process in Afghanistan. For instance, Troika plus Pakistan uh, or Moscow format, uh, and uh, we see that, uh, like Americans also say, uh, that uh, to use more diplomatic measures, uh, diplomatic steps, just to help uh, Afghans uh, uh, to uh, somehow to solve conflict. But uh, generally now, uh, Moscow has a, a vital interest, like many other countries um, interest in a stable, secure, prosperous, friendly and neutral Afghanistan, uh, free from terrorism, of course, uh, from extremism and drugs. Uh, and uh, there should be no threat to the neighboring countries, of course, from the territory of Afghanistan, including uh, the uh, Central Asian states, for instance. Of course, uh, Russia is interesting, uh, interested in neutralizing potential threats from uh, terrorist groups in Afghanistan. You know that the concentration of terrorist groups in Afghanistan is the biggest in, in the world. I mean, uh, and it is not only a matter of physical opposition, uh, but also uh, combating the export of extremist uh, ideas. Uh, uh, but as long as Afghanistan is uh, in a situation of civil war, and insecurity, it is uh, difficult to develop comprehensive relations seriously with Afghanistan. The, and this is, uh, this is really a problem. Uh, 
uh, but uh, it seems to me that uh, that now uh, at present uh, Russia's main task uh, is to assist uh, in the peaceful settlement of the Afghan conflict. Russia is not a major player, of course, in Afghan affairs. Uh, the main players are uh, official Kabul, uh, the Taliban, the United States, and Pakistan, I think. So, and uh, Russia is supporting and working with all of these, all these countries uh, and uh, Taliban movement. Okay, thank you very much. Now, um, looking at the German perspective, perspective Mr. Kruger, um, the three uh, panelists before you have uh, unanimously uh, called for a peaceful solution. And Germany indeed has for the longest time uh, supported uh, what is known in uh, development uh, uh, theory as capacity building, and especially focused on Afghan security forces, Afghan police education. Um, how does uh, Germany, now that it will also leave within the NATO and uh, together with uh, the US, review its deployment within the mandate and the impact it had on Afghanistan? Was it successful? Well, I mean, first of all, uh, two things. Uh, thank you uh, for the invitation uh, to you and all your colleagues. Um, and uh, second, uh, since I'm still officially in government uh, and will continue to do so. Of course, I have to stress that everything I say uh, is only attributable to me. It's my personal opinion. Uh, it's not uh, a government statement um, and should not be treated as such. Um, so to your uh, question, um, you picked out one uh, important dimension of the German uh, cooperation uh, with and uh, policy towards Afghanistan, uh, the security dimension, which, of course, uh, for the German uh, government at that time, uh, if we look back at 2001, was a real watershed moment, uh, because um, to deploy such a number of troops abroad, uh, in such a, a very uh, uh, difficult uh, context was something that post-war Germany hasn't had, hadn't done uh, since um, uh, since its its beginnings. Um, so, uh, and I think one has to remember that at that time um, it was clearly felt uh, across the spectrum of German. Uh, policy decision makers, that if Germany would not participate in that endeavor, um, the transatlantic alliance would be at risk. And as I'm sure you and many uh, here are very aware, uh, the transatlantic alliance is one of the cornerstones of our, um, of our uh, um, uh, foreign policy, foreign security policy. Um, and our identity um, as a, in post-war Germany. So um, this uh, remained very important to us. So I think from that perspective, uh, uh, the uh, deployment uh, was a success because uh, we uh, managed to show that uh, the alliance is actually there if it's needed. Um, actually, in a rather... I don't think many people suspected when they when the when NATO was founded that it would you know uh, be tested in Afghanistan. But uh, uh, you know um, uh, history has its own uh, logic. Uh, anyway, uh, and I think we also succeeded uh, to some extent at least in uh, training and advising uh, Afghan troops uh, together with our with our partners uh, in NATO and the mission and now I mean after 2014 mission resolute support um, when it comes to the overall uh, 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 policy in Afghanistan uh, as uh, Omar already said the, the the picture is much much more uh, mixed um, uh, and I would basically uh, subscribe to his balance sheet, you know, uh, of, of success and failure. Uh, clearly, uh, there are some uh, um, obvious failures. Uh, narcotics, for example, is one of them, uh, some others too. Um, nevertheless, I would say that um, when you look at Afghans uh, themselves, um, there are probably, uh, you know, people won 
a lot and people lost a lot. Uh, people want new freedoms, new perspectives, new educations, new opportunities, and people, but also people lost tremendously uh, over the course of the last two decades, um, and um, and uh, often in very uh, tragic and brutal ways. Uh, and the suffering uh, continues uh, today, and it will continue tomorrow, and it uh, uh, continued yesterday. Um, so. I think when we talk about balance sheet, we also have to be very humble because um, we are not experiencing the, uh, the uh, danger and the tragedy as uh, Afghans do uh, uh, when, uh, you know, every day and night, basically, in Afghanistan. Um, one last point, um, you know, our troops are coming home um but uh, but germany is not leaving uh you know germany is actually one of the points where the republic and the taliban agree they want germany and other international actors to stay uh, we just had yesterday uh, a quite engaging discussion with the taliban um, and they clearly underlined uh, that uh, they want Germany to stay. Um, so um, the, I think that's actually quite an interesting and remarkable uh, development if you look at, you know, uh, let's say the history over the last uh, 30 years of, of the Taliban. Um, so... Um, we want to continue our uh, support for the peace process, most and for all, the political process, the intra-Afghan negotiations. Um, we want to continue our assistance to Afghanistan, the Afghan people, you know, with uh, development cooperation, stabilization efforts, uh, education, uh, and so on. So to some extent, um, yes, an important chapter is about to be closed, but it's only one dimension. And I think the, uh, the work with Afghanistan and with the Afghan people uh, will uh, uh, continue, at least that's our uh, wish. And um, we hear the same from the Republic side uh, as from the Taliban side. Thank you very much. Now, um, of course, I haven't uh, forgotten you, Mr. Rahim. I uh, purposely, uh, purposefully um, wanted to first see the international perspectives. Now, uh, today in the German newspaper uh, Spiegel, there was an article that uh, mentioned uh, Ms. Zarifa Rafari, uh, who is uh, the youngest and uh, a female um, mayor in an Afghan city. Her uh, age is 26 years. And she uh, looks at the Doha Accord and uh, the fact that the United States and the NATO are leaving uh, militarily um, in a very negative way. She called it a, um, a deal that does not benefit um, uh, the uh, people, the Afghan people. And also many sources claim that uh, the fact that US and NATO retreat is simply out of financial reasons. What do you think from an Afghan perspective right now, especially from Kabul? I think that uh, Mukhtar actually uh, dropped because at the beginning also he had uh, difficulties uh, because of power uh, outages. So it probably happened again. So yeah. maybe uh, someone else of our panelists can answer this question. Yes, who wants to jump in? Let's uh, do it flexibly. Uh, let me let me offer uh, an Afghan uh, perspective since I wear two hats. Uh, <laughs> and uh, uh, I, I think that... Uh, the worry and the concerns that some elements of society have in Afghanistan are valid. Uh, I mean, but we also have to remember that this country does not need a babysitter all its life, all the time. We need to, first of all, sort out our own country. We need to address the issues that have divided us over 43 years, not just 20, 43 years since a communist coup took place in 1978, the Soviet Union invaded, more than a million people were killed, there was a resistance, then the, there was no political settlement, unfortunately, back then. Um, and uh, what we are trying to do now, 
at this stage when the U.S. is leaving is to basically uh, reinvent and redo what we should have done maybe uh, 30 years ago or more or less. Um, and now uh, we have an opportunity. So Afghanistan went through civil war, went through the Taliban takeover, Al-Qaeda and terrorist groups came, um, and then 9-11 took place. 9-11 uh, basically shifted all attention back towards this country and the fact that uh, you never leave uh, a nation uh, strategically located like Afghanistan, um, you don't ignore it and you have to help it stand on its own feet so it doesn't become a, a problem for itself and for others. Um, and that's exactly what we've been trying to do. Uh, so I think that um, the last 20 years, the international community has been extremely generous and patient. The Afghan people have been extremely patient with their leaders. I have been part of that leadership and that elite, and unfortunately or fortunately, that, that's not the point. But um, I think that we uh, have done a miserable job of uh, rebuilding our country and taking charge of our destiny and uniting our people instead of, instead of dividing our people uh, and uh, making sure that everything becomes sustainable and not fragile. And obviously at some point we had a chance to bring the Taliban in. Uh, I think we missed that opportunity. And again, as I explained earlier, uh, there were other forces beyond Afghan control that basically shaped our destiny. Even today, the Afghans do not have enough sovereignty as they should. And I think that we need to shift that. We need to rebalance that. So what we need is a rebalancing. And so the, the, our sister, the mayor, is, is right. She should be concerned. But we have to do everything to uh, have a realistic look at Afghanistan. We cannot look at Afghanistan just uh, at a few um, communities in big cities. Afghanistan is a country of 35 million people. Uh, uh, the demographics are very clear. Uh, we cannot uh, ignore the socioeconomic, the ethnic issues that exist. And 43 years of war, continuous war, uh, it takes a big toll on its population and we need to heal. So first thing we need to do is agree and have the political will to solve the problem politically, to sit down, talk. The talk is not going to be easy because you have the Taliban on one hand with their own worldview. We hope they have learned something. We hope they have changed a little bit. I'm very happy to hear our German friend, Mr. Kruger, say that the Taliban are amenable to uh, international assistance and aid. That is very good news. Um, and so as far as Afghan populations are concerned, the rights of women, the rights of minorities, the progress that we've made on education uh, to the extent possible, uh, the rights, freedom of expression, media, all of that has to be protected, but we have to have a discussion on this. We have to agree on a middle ground. We have to agree to something that works for most Afghans, not just small cliques of Afghans, most Afghans, rural, urban, rich, poor. A lot of people became extremely rich in the past 20 years, but 99% of the people remain poor. 70% of Afghanistan lives below poverty. And this is after more than $200 billion were spent by the international community in Afghanistan. So we need to learn the lessons and we need to not repeat the mistakes of the past so that we can fix this country. But the first steps obviously are to move towards a dialogue and negotiations. Thank you very much. Um, Ambassador Khan, um, as uh, already started, uh, I would like to look more into the inclusion of the Taliban, which uh, obviously, uh, especially regarding the Doha agreement, will be the next step. Um, uh, in your opinion, or from the perspective of the Pakistani government, how realistic are the prospects of having successful, constructive, and peaceful talks with the Taliban? And what will the ties that um, uh, the Taliban have with some elements within uh, um, Pakistan have to play in here? Okay. <clears throat> uh, so I believe it really depends, and I would say once again what Mr. Kruger has just said, 
that this is a very encouraging sign on the part of the Taliban that they want to have an interface with the international community. That is a very good sign. But we will have to see really how the Taliban behave. As I said earlier, if they have the same kind of hubris, the same kind of arrogance that the Americans had at in 2002, and they think that now Afghanistan is just a walkover, I think the Taliban would be committing a big mistake. I don't speak for the government of Pakistan, but I believe that it would be Pakistan's endeavor. Right from the very beginning, consistently, to tell the Taliban that the best way to go about is to have reconciliation with all the elements in Afghanistan. Unless and until these major stakeholders in Afghanistan are not a part of the big deal, then in Afghanistan, unfortunately, there is not going to be peace. Uh, Taliban will not be able to have all the cake. Of course. And therefore, it is imperative. Imperative for the Taliban, imperative for the government, imperative for the neighbors of Afghanistan. And I sincerely believe, after what uh, Mr. Samad has just said, these 40 years in which primarily it is the Afghan people who have suffered. A million and a half Afghans have died and a million displaced and so on and so forth. That after this, everybody ought to realize. And I feel that the neighbors, Pakistan, Iran, Russia, and the others realize this, that the that the uh, Afghan players are nobody's puppets. And that the best way to go about is to bring them, to gradually nudge them to the negotiating table. They have had their fingers burnt. We have had our fingers burnt. The Iranians have had their fingers burnt. The Americans, the Russians, everybody. It is now in the interest, as Mr. Samad said, of the people of Afghanistan primarily. Thank you very much. Uh, Mr. Kruger, you said uh, you were, we were talking about that already before. Uh, could you please a um, elaborate a bit on that? Um, the Taliban, have they, how, how, how far have they changed? The German government focused on empowering local civil communities, including girls' schools, which has been unthinkable under the Taliban rule in 2000, 2001. Have they changed regarding female education and human rights, or uh, do they still think only in terms of hand grenades and Kalashnikovs? Well, again, uh, it's not really for me to judge, because the true judge of that are the, the Afghan people in all their diversity. And I think you would get very different <laughs> answers from different uh, people in within Afghanistan. Um, we talk continuously uh, with uh, the Taliban negotiation team, with the TPC, uh, because we are supporting that endeavor to find a constructive approach in these uh, negotiations together with, uh, obviously, the uh, government of Qatar with uh, some other friends like Norway, United Nations, and of course, Pakistan. Um, the, um, and what they say is uh, that, yes, they are uh, supporting, I mean, first of all, unified a strong uh, central government um, in Afghanistan, 
Um, and I think one of the interesting um, one of the interesting aspects uh, of this debate is that, for example, when you come to this question, uh, the true fault line, so to speak, is uh, not so much between the Taliban and the uh, Republic side, but you would have on the Republic side people who argue for a strong central government, and you have other people who uh, would uh, uh, or who do argue uh, quite forcefully for a different setup, a much more decentralized setup. Uh, so uh, the question, for example, when it comes to that, is not so black and white. Uh, um, and I think that goes for some other uh, issues as well. When you come to, let's say, uh, women's rights and women education, you have, I think, also on the side of the Republic or of those who support the Republic, uh, people who, by our standards, um, are, are uh, certainly not leaders of uh, uh, women's rights and women participation in public life. Um, so the picture often is much more blurred uh, than uh, I think uh, uh, it sometimes uh, uh, is, 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 is painted. Um, so um, the true test, of course, uh, uh, is, are not words, but what happens uh, uh, where the Taliban have control. And again there, I think the, the, the picture is, is, is very mixed. Uh, you have on the one side uh, uh, places where, for example, um, Afghans tell us, that uh, local governance is certainly far, far, uh, far from perfect, but um, uh, not catastrophic, or at least not in a catastrophic way, different from what they experienced sometimes before. Uh, but you also have other places and other uh, 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 um, uh, uh, strands, so to speak, where uh, uh, you really feel that they have not changed at all from the 90s. Uh, and the early 2000s. So uh, I think the, the, the question is, is very much still out there. Um, what I find remarkable is that um, what appeared now over the last 12 months is that the Taliban, the public side, found a way of talking with each other with respect, um, with quite open discussions. Uh, that was not, I mean, if you consider the last 40 years uh, of war and all the things that happened also sometimes on very personal levels between also some of the people represented in both sides, that's not necessarily uh, something you should take for granted. And if you look at peace processes from an abstract level, uh, that's quite an accomplishment if you compare it with other uh, conflicts around the globe. The big problem from our perspective is that uh, uh, at the same time, you have a, a, a very uh, vicious and brutal war going on. So uh, in order for these negotiations or pre-negotiations to really go somewhere, uh, you would need uh, a, a true de-escalation. Uh, and um, what worries at, at the moment is that um, you see the opposite uh, uh, of the last uh, couple of weeks, uh, especially again, uh, violence is picking up. Uh, and I think that is the true danger for these negotiations um, is, uh, the, is the war happening at the same time. You can, and it often happened in history, negotiate and fight at the same time, but only to a certain level. Uh, at some point, um, uh, uh, war makes negotiations impossible. And I'm not sure if we are not uh, reaching that point in some foreseeable future. That's one of our main concerns. Okay. Um... That's very interesting. Now, from a, a Russian perspective, Mr. Machiditsa, um, looking at what's, what has been said before, um, the prim primarily uh, Russia was motivated before by the violent extremism in uh, Chechnya. Now that the Taliban might get a chair at the table, 
um, how politically capable are they and what are the prospects of them building a state that will refrain from um, what the Taliban has been uh, infamous for before? Uh, Taliban, you know, uh, uh, there are some doubts, of course, about uh, their values and uh, their behavior, uh, for instance, uh, because they mentioned many times that they would like to create an Islamic Emirate, Emirate in Afghanistan. So, and uh, uh, they did not give us details about what, what they mean, uh, how it will be. So, uh, but um, still it is a, uh, it is a problem. It, it seems uh, that Taliban uh, now, for instance, as I know, I don't know, uh, maybe uh, Mr. Kruger has more information about it, but uh, that uh, before they supported the idea of interim government. And now it seems that they are going to refuse from this idea. And uh, they are refusing, why they are refusing? They're maybe because uh, they would like to be decision makers in the government because they would like to govern and they don't, uh, uh, don't want to play, to, uh, to have a secondary role in the, in the government. So uh, as you know, uh, they were against the idea of elections first also because uh, they are saying that, uh, first of all, they are not ready for elections uh, and they need time for that just to prepare for elections. Uh, and then uh, they uh, also um, have uh, problems with their fighters because uh, they have uh, to stop fighting and they have to demobilize fighters. But if you demobilize fighters, it's very difficult later on to mobilize them again. So if something is wrong, so uh, and uh, uh, this this problems always always uh, there are problems with with uh, with, with Taliban because uh, uh, sometimes uh, some it seems to us that sometimes they don't uh, accept some compromises uh, uh, which are there uh, at the table. So and um, that's why we uh, we think that. Uh, we, we think that uh, it will be uh, very difficult for them uh, uh, just to um, get what they want, uh, because it, of course it depends on the position of uh, the United States and uh, other uh, other countries who support uh, Afghan government. But um, uh, Taliban, it seems that they are going to continue fighting, and now, for instance, they are fighting clashes in 24 provinces of Afghanistan. So it's, 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 it's uh, very serious. And uh, nobody knows what uh, happens uh, in summertime. Uh, in summertime, they have to continue because this is their main leverage, as, uh, as, as you know. So just to, to fight and uh, to get some something, just some, uh, to get some achievements. Uh, and uh, to come to power. Because as I remember before, once they were talked some years ago, uh, they wanted uh, to get uh, they wanted to get um, um, under control, uh, for instance, security forces, uh, police, and and army. So uh, otherwise, uh, they think that otherwise uh, they cannot trust the government. So otherwise, they are helpless. You know, they can do nothing. Uh, so and uh, this is this is this is a, a big problem with Taliban. So. Um, Mr. Kruger, you look like you want to uh, briefly come back on this or not? Okay, okay, cool. Um, then, uh, yes, uh, thank you very much. Um, I would like to, to go to the next uh, topic, um, looking at especially the role of Pakistan, Iran, and India. And let's start with uh, Ambassador, um, uh, with um, uh, Mr. Khan. Um, with foreign forces leaving Afghanistan and Pakistan being skeptical of Shia influences in Kabul and uh, Indian uh, democratization efforts. Um, how will the Pakistani government act towards Afghanistan, the Pashto tribes, and the regional hegemonic struggle? And most importantly, how altruistic is Pakistan really? Or how much is it uh, uh, involved in an um, uh, indirect proxy war with Iran and India? Okay, thank you very much. <clears throat> 
There is, frankly, Philip, you know, there is no question of altruism in foreign policy. I only have to cite the dictum of Lord Palmerston, the British Prime Minister in the middle of the 19th century, and he is reputed to have said that there are no permanent enemies, there are no permanent friends, there are only permanent interests. What are our interests in Afghanistan? Our interests are in Afghanistan Frankly, we have nothing to do with what you just said, whether there should be a Shia government or not. Pakistan was founded by a Shia. Pakistan's cabinet, parliament, judiciary is full of Shias. So there is no such problem in Pakistan. We don't mind whatever the Afghans want, the Afghans should have. Whether it is Shia, Sunni, Christian, Hindu, Sikh, whatever it is, that is not the question. The question is now, Pakistan outside of Afghanistan is the country most negatively impacted by whatever is happening in Afghanistan. And in the past 40 years, we know those cataclysmic events that have taken place as a result of which millions of refugees we've got, as a result of which we have the proliferation of guns in Pakistan. In Pakistan, in the 70s, there was not one person addicted to drugs. Now, 40 years later, over 2 million drug addicts in Pakistan. And then again in the war on terror, Pakistan has lost 70,000 men, women, and children. 70,000. Over a hundred billion worth of assets we have lost. So that is how we have been impacted. And why have we been impacted by this? Because there is turmoil, violence in Afghanistan. That is one thing we do not want. We don't care whatever government comes in Afghanistan. As long as that government is broad-based, for only a broad-based government, in which they are the Taliban, the uh, Ashraf Ghani government people, the Tajiks, the Uzbeks, the uh, Hazaras, all of them should have a stake in peace and stability and security in Afghanistan. That is exactly what we want, whatever influence we have on the Taliban. Thank you. We will exercise it towards this end, not towards any other thing we don't want. We've had our fingers burnt in Afghanistan. Okay. We don't want, everybody has, we know it's uh, the graveyard of empires. That it is indeed. So therefore, <laughs> Thank you very much. Now, uh, I have just seen that uh, Mr. Rahim is back online. Uh, so let me uh, directly uh, confront you uh, with the next question. Um, as we just have heard uh, uh, about the interest of Pakistan in Afghanistan, um, I would like you to, uh, uh, to give me an insight into the Afghani perspective on uh, being surrounded by uh, Pakistan, India, and Iran and their interests, as well as in a, a bigger perspective, uh, the US and Russia. Uh, hi to everyone. Yes, uh, I'm back. Uh, I had some con connection issues. Well, um, I haven't heard to uh, all of the discussions uh, uh, during the sessions, so I might be repeating Certain, th certain things that might have already been said, uh, but forgive me for that, for the reason that I was disconnected. Well, you know, I was hearing to a couple of discussions before getting part of Hans' uh, discussion about the Afghan, uh, Pakistan interest and impact of Afghan conflict on Pakistan. You know, uh, 
unfortunately, most of the times, even on the academic forums, uh, when we talk about the issues of the region, uh, be it uh, Indo-Pak issues, be it Sino-Indian issues, be it that Afghan-Pakistan issues, broader Russian engagement in the region, most of the times, even on the academic uh, forums, we talk that uh, political rhetoric, uh, political correctness is the order of the day for many of the people. And that's where we are not able to reach to the uh, roots of the issues and, and the problems. I and mean, we are not able to really analyze what really is causing this whole turmoil in the region. And uh, that is some, something that concerns me when you compare this region with many others in the world. And that's why we have not been able to tackle the issues. Uh, let's talk about the AFPAC issues as far as the Afghan peace is concerned. Don't track issues down to the last 20 years or the 9-11 and post-9-11 era. AFPAC issues date back to the 60s and 70s of the 20th century, uh, where the two countries had a lukewarm relationship, uh, diplomatic relationship. And because of certain issues, there is the territorial dispute, which pa Pakistan does not recognizes something to be legitimate. Afghans have always been adamant that there is one. The Pakistani uh, interest in Afghanistan post-Russian invasion, all these perspectives have to be uh, realized and recognized before really going into the discussion. Afghanistan right now is at a crossroad where there are so many interests or attached to Afghanistan. When Mr. Khan talks about the broad-based government, uh, it's more about the same uh, agenda that was pursued during the late 80s, early 90s, the strategic depth issue. And the Pakistani government, again, is trying to manipulate to make sure that they're part of the, 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 the solution in Afghanistan and things are sol uh, solved and resolved as the Pakistani establishment want those. Uh, that, is, that is one part of it. Uh, Coming back to the Pakistan interest, see, they have been a strategic partner with the, with the NATO throughout this conflict, but who can really ignore this? And from where the Taliban have been operating? Yes, the Americans made so many uh, mistakes as far as the Afghan context is concerned and conflict is concerned. Yes, the Afghan government made so many mistakes, but in the meantime, uh, those mistakes were capitalized upon for the personal reasons, for the strategic... Uh, uh, interest of the of the countries in the region, because of which we are in a situation where things may explode. And this time, if things explode, I can tell you that it's not going to stay within the Afghan realms, within, within the ter ter territorial uh, control of Afghanistan. It's going to challenge the stability of the, of the whole region. And that is why I would emphasize on the fact that let's leave the political rhetoric, let's leave the really that uh, uh, official narratives that we keep putting forward as part of our uh, foreign office, uh, uh, what do you call it, uh, these uh, press statements. Rather, let's look at the uh, root causes of this whole conflict and the, the issues. Pakistanis are concerned and, and they think that uh, they need an Afghanistan which is more friendlier towards them, which is more of a sort of accepting the influence and, 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 and uh, engage in a sort of uh, relationship with them which, which suits their uh, regional interest. The Indians, of course, are looking for their own regional allies in order to tackle uh, and, and settle their scores with the Pakistanis. Of course, the Russians want uh, a region that, that, that does not challenge their internal security, and they want to maintain a buffer from the threats of the jihadist movements, from these so-called Islamic State threats. Let's look at all these things from this the perspective of great uh, uh, picture that we have in front of us as, as a region, as a country problems. Afghanistan has issues with Pakistan. Uh, as a government in Afghanistan that is not more of a, a friendlier towards Pakistan, which treat, uh, deals with them on an equal footing. They don't want that. Why is it that? that? Let's address those concerns. So my, my main emphasis on this, in this discussion is that, first of all, when we talk about the issues of the region, it's not about post-9-11. We have a history there, which has been dominating this whole uh, uh, regional relationship and dynamics of proxy politics and uh, track one diplomacy. We have uh, the post-9-11 issues that the 
the, the, the Russian has with the, with the Americans. And of course, Chinese have their own concerns. And in the light of this whole discussion, we have to unpack this whole uh, uh, discussion around Afghanistan and the ongoing conflict and the possibility of the upcoming peace process. Thank you very much. Uh, I was just <laughs> mute for a second, sorry. Um, what you just said, uh, leaving press statements aside, um, let's uh, take this exact statement. And uh, I would like to ask uh, Mr. Machiti, um, in the past years, Russia has expanded its uh, uh, foot stamp, especially in, in, in previously uh, Soviet uh, owned areas such as uh, Georgia, uh, Nagorno-Karabakh, uh, Eastern Ukraine. Um, now, if uh, the US and NATO uh, leave Afghanistan, um, will Russia use this to expand their footnote to more strongly counterbalance American or even maybe Chinese influence in the region? And how will this benefit the future of the Afghan people? Uh, <clears throat> so, uh, no, I think uh, uh, I already mentioned about the Russian position. So um, we would like to have uh, friendly and uh, uh, neutral Afghanistan. Uh, and we would like to cooperate with Afghanistan to have good relations. And you remember a, um, uh, 40, 50, 50 years ago, uh, we managed to build in Afghanistan 142 industrial and infrastructure objects. So uh, it was many of them, unfortunately, have been destroyed, but uh, uh, still, uh, but it was very important for the development of uh, Afghanistan. So the same we are going, uh, if, if it will be possible, um, uh, we are going to, 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 to help Afghanistan to, to do the same. Uh, but uh, of course, uh, we are not uh, thinking about uh, any uh, military ideas, you know, just uh, to, to use uh, somehow force or whatever. Uh, just to, to, to the, in, in some way in the region. So it's uh, it's already not the case anymore. Uh, but um, I think I think that uh, uh, this government uh, we try to help also the government. Uh, there are some projects uh, uh, just uh, which uh, which we have together with some other countries. For instance. Uh, for instance, uh, as uh, part of joint project between Russia, Japan and the uh, UN Office on Drugs and Crime, uh, in September 2020, uh, it was a ceremony held in Kabul to start the construction of Sinological uh, Center of the Anti-Drug Police uh, of the Ministry of Internal Affairs uh, of Afghanistan. So uh, just such kind of uh, projects are very important for uh, Afghanistan. But we think that uh, even without um, uh, uh, without foreign troops, uh, uh, foreign troops uh, on Afghan soil, I think that it doesn't mean that Afghan government will collapse immediately. Uh, I think that if we compare the situation with the Afghan government now and mm, Afghan government, for instance, in Najibullah's time in the end of uh, 80s, so it's totally different because at that time, you remember it was an uh, agreement, so-called zero zero agreement, which was signed between Soviet Union and the United States in Geneva. And uh, according to this agreement, we stopped, uh, uh, stopped delivering weapons and uh, uh, any assistance to, to, to uh, Najibullah government. And uh, uh, the same uh, was, um, uh, it was an obligation for the other side, but unfortunately, the other side did not do it. So, but now, now, uh, Afghan government has all possibilities. First of all, they are uh, much better, better weaponed. Uh, they have, uh, 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 plus, uh, there is a very good sign uh, that uh, US and NATO countries uh, are going to leave some military equipment in Afghanistan for one billion, uh, one billion dollars. If I am not mistaken, if it's true, of course I don't know. But I hope that uh, this military and financial assistance will continue for Afghan government, so Afghan government can manage to resist much, much longer. Uh, Najibullah managed to resist for three years uh, without any help. And uh, uh, contemporary Afghan government will resist, I think, much, much longer.
Thank you. I saw uh, Mr. Samat, Ambassador Samat, you wanted to uh, get back on that. You raised your hand before. Well, yeah, th thank you. Um, uh, I have uh, two comments um, about um, our colleague, Mr. Mashidzitsi's remarks. Uh, one, right now, which he made about the sustainability of the Afghan forces right now receiving aid in order to uh, defend themselves and, and uh, continue the, uh, the, 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 the conflict in one way or the other. Uh, we, I, I think uh, after 43 years of uh, these uh, um, back and forth uh, attempts at trying to provoke war again in Afghanistan, we need to um, think totally differently. We need, to, we need a mind shift away from conflict and war in Afghanistan. We need a mind shift and a shift in the paradigm shift towards peace building and peacemaking. Uh, I think 43 years and three generations of Afghans is enough. Uh, uh, and we don't need, uh, yes, we do need to defend and we do need to have means to protect our people. Uh, but at the same time, this is now an intra-Afghan conflict as the Americans are leaving. And I don't think anybody from the outside, spoilers from the outside, proxy warriors from the outside and forever warriors from the outside who benefit from war should um, uh, engage in uh, pursuing a, 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 a policy that continues to keep the flames alive. I think that would, that would be disastrous for the Afghan people and for the country itself. Uh, we need to put all our efforts and our thinking into how to resolve this issue and how to end conflict in Afghanistan so the region can be more stable, so we can have the connectivities that we need, so we can have the economic integration we need, so we can have the, the trade and transit that we need, so we can have, yes, there are issues between India and Pakistan, we know. There are issues between Iran and, and, and the US and maybe Saudi Arabia, we know. There are issues between Russia and the US, we know. There are issues between China and the US, we know. But you know, at the end of the day, uh, nobody's going to win. Everybody is going to be a loser at the end of the day. And we, we need to stop the cycle of repeating the same uh, paradigms and the same mindset and thinking that takes us back to using Afghanistan as a battlefield. And the Afghans are the first that need to be responsible. I, I'm talking to my own people my own leaders from this side or that side, they're all, you know, whether they're Taliban or they're a common government or, or anyone, we need to agree and we need to realize that enough is enough and that there's no more, there's no more space for conflict in Afghanistan because the, the, the country is almost breathless. Yes. yes. Uh, and so, so let me, another point that, uh, was made earlier was about the interim government. Uh, we don't know yet. I think it would be a big mistake by the Taliban, uh, as our friend uh, Nick Balhan has said, uh, hubris would be a huge mistake on anybody's part, whether it's Kabul, Talib, US, anybody. Uh, we, we need to realize that uh, a, a, a political path forward means getting over the hurdles that exist. Uh, it, and it has to go through stages. This is a process, a very complex process. The Taliban at this stage or anyone at this stage cannot commit to certain things unless we reach that point. In order to reach that point, we first need to, for example, uh, uh, agree on how, whether to or how to delist the Taliban from the UN blacklist. For example, how do we deal with the 7,000 or so Taliban prisoners or how many Afghan soldiers are in the Taliban hands uh, who need to be exchanged in order to build trust and in order to be able to move to the next hurdle. This is a very complex, so interim government is an issue down the road. It's an issue at, at some point that may come up or may not come up, but a transition is absolutely essential in one way or the other. We cannot be stuck in where we are right now because status quo uh, means uh, more conflict and more bloodshed. Uh, but I want to 
turn attention to the fact that the political process is the only thing that can save Afghanistan, uh, that more war is, is the worst option, and that the process is complex and has steps. And right now, the focus is how to get everybody to sit around the table in Istanbul, in Turkey, presumably, in the next few weeks. Uh, and so all efforts are geared towards that, towards starting negotiations again. And then what happens during negotiations, uh, <laughs> we hope, is going to address some of the issues that everybody is concerned about. Uh, and it's going to be probably be negotiations that will last two, three years. Meanwhile, we need a transition and we need an interim period. Maybe we even need power sharing of some kind. But it will be, uh, uh, it will be temporary because Afghanistan needs to be on stable ground. And we need to see, we need to revisit the constitution. We need to see how we can uh, uh, do a dis disarmament uh, 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 and the demobilization of forces. But the first thing that we need to do is build a, a, an environment that can, as Mr. Kruger said earlier, can assure a reduction in violence and maybe a ceasefire so we can start the talks knowing that uh, no more Afghans are being killed on the field as the U.S. and others are leaving. So I hope that we can, we can realize that there is a very unique opportunity in moment at this point that needs to be seized. Perfect. Thank you very much. Um, now we have um, one last uh, topic looking at the future of Afghanistan. And given that we only have 15, maybe 20 minutes left before the questions start, I would ask everybody to maybe um, briefen the uh, answers a little bit. Um, but now going ahead with Mr. Kruger, um, looking at what has been said before, and if we exclude all foreign actors, uh, we are left with three major actors in Afghanistan, which is the Afghan government, which is the Taliban, and which is um, some kind of uh, regional fragmentation due to warlords, strongmen that maybe play their own game. And historically, um, we know that uh, the Afghan government has utilized some of the money that they get by, by the US, by, by NATO, by, by foreign countries to also buy loyalty uh, with these regional strongmen. Uh, money against safety or money against uh, um, not uh, engaging in conflict. Um, looking at the future uh, without any military involvement, um, will uh, Germany step up their game uh, with financial support to maintain that uh, collaboration between regional strongmen and uh, the central government? And how will they uh, yeah, support um, this reconciliation process? Um. Now I do something that uh, uh, people on panels love to do is saying, this is a really interesting question because you gain time uh, uh, and thinking about it. Um, I would frame it a little bit differently, actually. Uh, it's not quite the way we look at this, uh, at the situation right now. We have uh, in Afghanistan, a very complex domestic situation. And it's a personal hobby horse of mine uh, to try to avoid the words like spoiler uh, or, or others to that effect. Um, you know, people are not black and white and, uh, you know, everybody uh, is, has certain interests and, 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 and needs. Um, and I also would uh, say that um, you, if I may say so, uh, left out, I think a very important component uh, of the current equation, which, uh, for lack of a better word, people uh, describe as civil society. Um, civil society, of course, is, you know, a big, you know, uh, everything and nothing, you know, I mean, there are many people uh, uh, um, under that umbrella with very different uh, backgrounds and needs and, and, and so on. Uh, but still, I think it's important to uh, keep in mind that the Afghan society is, uh, has radically, radically modernized itself uh, uh, over the course of the last decades. And it's a very uh, uneven and often very violent process of modernization, um, just actually uh, than in many other countries and, and, and continents as well. 
uh, unfortunately, processes of modernization are often uh, accompanied by, by violence, as we know in Europe. Um, the, um, uh, so uh, I would say the question is how to address all those, all those uh, needs. Um, the, the, I very much liked uh, uh, what I think um, Ambassador uh, Khan uh, said about the dangers of hubris. And, uh, you know, if you look at German history over the last 150 years, you have some lessons about the dangers of hubris uh, there. Um, and uh, so this uh, is... Uh, I think a very important moment also for the Taliban movement to reflect on the dangers of hubris. I think there are some people in the movement who understand this, this challenge. Um, so uh, I think, uh, and I agree with what uh, uh, Georgi Machitice said, um, we don't see an immediate, uh, you know, collapse uh, or, or so of the current uh, uh, system. Um, it will be challenged, uh, but there is not only the, the foreign money and the foreign um, support there, but there's also, um, as I said, there many, uh, Afghanistan is a very young society nowadays. Um, uh, and this current um, system has a lot of support, especially in civil society. One should not forget that. And I think that's something that, um, that it's, it's going to be very interesting to see how it actually plays out. Um, from the German perspective, uh, last year, I think it was late November, early December in Geneva at the uh, donors conference, we made clear that uh, we will uh, continue or uh, to uh, support the Afghan society, the Afghan uh, people um, uh, over the next, at least the next four years um, with roughly the same amounts as we did before. Um, it's still the largest uh, uh, recipient of, of bilateral aid. Um, um, in all the countries, all the crises around the world, and will probably continue to be so for foreseeable future. Um, but this uh, uh, help, uh, assistance is not coming without certain uh, conditions. And we made our conditions very uh, transparent, and we also talked with the Taliban about it. There are the European Council conclusions from 2019 repeated in 2020, where we clearly, uh, you know, uh, state um, that uh, certain parts of our of our uh, aid, our our support, is conditioned on basic human rights, a constitutional based order, etc., etc., etc. And um, so we have a certain compass uh, 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 when we look at. Uh, the difficult questions uh, uh, ahead. Um, so, uh, yes, I think everybody would agree that the current political system needs reform. The question uh, is, uh, how do you do it? And there we would say, you have to do it via negotiations, not by force. And uh, we hope that both sides, uh, especially the Taliban, but also some actors on the other side, understand that uh, a, a new test of will, so to speak, on the military, uh, on, the, on the battlefield, uh, will be a dead end. People, it, the question is, will you reach uh, the conclusion that uh, you can gain nothing on the battlefield before you spend uh, uh, many more lives or, or after. Uh, Philip, you are mute. Yes, yes. Uh, Ambassador Khan, how would you come back to what Mr. Kruger just said? Quite right. <clears throat> so I think it is extremely important that all the parties should realize that there is no military solution in Afghanistan. 
when you look at the correlation of forces, notwithstanding the dire predictions of many Western defense analysts and others, Afghan experts, who believe that the present Afghan regime might not be able to successfully defend itself. I personally, when I look at it on paper at least, I find that the Afghan regime is in a position to defend itself against any onslaught. They are more than three times the size of the Taliban. The problem is what the United States Special Inspector General for Afghan Reconstruction has to observe. That there is just too much corruption, inefficiency, desertions, and all in the Afghan security forces. These need to be taken care of. Therefore, so that in case the Taliban have any notions that Afghanistan will be a walkover now, those notions need to be belied. Okay. I think it is very important that there should be that realization. As far as the other incentives are concerned, that is the job of the international community. If the Taliban behave properly, you give them the incentives by lifting of sanctions, by the release of prisoners, and hold on to your incentives and to your promises. If they do not behave, then the screws need to be tightened not only by the international community, but by the neighbors too. And I think this ought to be a reasonably responsible behavior. Okay. Um, I would add, if I may, just a sentence or two. Yes. I would like to really reassure Mr. Rahim, I don't know if he's still there, that, you know, we don't any longer want strategic depth. And I don't think there's anything wrong in having a friendly Afghanistan. So that is what we want. And we want it to be peaceful so that they prosper, the region prospers. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, now, unfortunately, we only have time for one last speaker, and I would uh, ask Mushtaq Rahim, especially because you didn't have the chance to answer so much before. Um, looking to the future, um, what are the chances for, for Afghanistan to, to get out of the mess of the last 20 years and become a prosperous nation? And what does the future for the Afghan people look like on the back of which the suffering of war has lied for so many years now? Sure. Uh, well, uh, first of all, uh, uh, I really thank Mr. Iqbal Khan for the uh, positive note, ending note uh, in his uh, discussion. I hope uh, what he's saying, usually Foreign uh, Office of Pakistan does not speak the same uh, policy and strategic language that the establishment and those who are concerned with Afghan and pa Indian uh, uh, foreign policy is concerned. They don't talk the same. But I hope that has changed. And I really hope that for the greater prosperity of the region, uh, but you know uh, what the news are coming out from the tribal areas, uh, former tribal areas of uh, uh, Pakistan managed tribal, uh, administered tribal areas. I think Taliban are regathering there. Uh, yesterday I had a, a Pakistani a national mem a member of National Assembly was talking about it. Anyways, um, uh, Afghanistan has great potential. And I think uh, we are in an era uh, which is called the era of the East uh, as far as the economic development and prosperity is concerned. And I think that's an opportunity uh, for Afghanistan and for the entire region. Uh, the regional integration is needed mu much more than ever in the past. And I think that's, a, that's again, a good news for Afghanistan. Uh, Pakistan and India is in need of Central Asian uh, connectivity. Uh, and, and Afghanistan is 
its door and footstep to the uh, Central Asian region. China is looking to expand its, its uh, regional reach for economic development. And I think, again, Afghanistan can play a role in that, not that significant in comparison to what Pakistan is offering, but certainly there are opportunities for them. I think all these dynamics, the regional dynamics, uh, th those are in favor of uh, a peaceful Afghanistan. And I think that's an opportunity uh, for Afghanistan uh, that can be capitalized on. But don't forget that uh, we are seeing a significant spike in the violence in Afghanistan right now. Almost all of the country is facing, is under attack uh, from the uh, Taliban side. And the Taliban are trying their utmost to make sure that they really uh, uh, send a sense of bother among the nation and the government. But then uh, the Afghan forces are holding up. Now, what does that mean? Even if the Afghan forces stand up to the challenge, as Mr. Samad earlier said, uh, still, I mean, that is something that we will be having a lot of bloodshed. And with the passage of time, uh, living amidst uh, the, the, what do you call it, civil war, intra-Afghan war, that creates more rift and divide uh, within the society among different frictions that, that we have. And that's going to challenge the stability even if you reach a, a peace deal uh, among these parties, still we will have so much of divide because of the conflict that is being waged right now. So the challenges are getting uh, uh, farther and farther. I mean, we are having more uh, problems amalgamating together, uh, which is going to challenge the peace building process. That is the most difficult part that's going to be. We may make peace, but then sustaining that will be a challenge. That is why, I mean, looking at the regional potential, the need of the countries, uh, neighboring countries, and the possibility of peace in Afghanistan with the challenges attached to that, we have a situation where the whole of the region must rally around this Afghan forces that are, that are playing uh, amidst the Afghan conflict to make sure that we reach a deal sooner rather than later, because as much as it gets extended and protection happens to the ongoing conflict, it's will become more complex and adding more complexity to it. Don't forget that we have a strong illicit economy, war economy attached to the Afghan conflict and expansion of this conflict, any further extension of this conflict is definitely going to benefit those illicit economies, those war economy and those actors who are in, involved in that. And that involvement is definitely going to fuel the conflict further. Now, what do I want to say is that my bottom line is that the countries of the region must come forward. You have been playing wait and see whether the, what, what the Americans do. All the countries of the region have been looking at the American reaction vis-a-vis -vis Afghanistan. Now they are out of the equation and it's about this whole region. My thinking is that Russia, China, Pakistan, to a certain extent, India and Iran will have to come together, look for a solution that is suitable for the whole region that is definitely going to help Afghanistan. Otherwise, if we continue to have this paradoxical uh, responses to the Afghan conflict and conflictive, in, conflicting interest uh, 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 presence in the region, that's definitely going to exacerbate the conflict, further the conflict. And, you know, yes, we can have all the positive talk, all the pap talk around what's going on, that the Afghan government must stand up to the challenge. You know, extension of conflict is always going to to, to challenge the stability of the region. And now don't forget that we are in the 21st century where the conflicts cannot be contained. Even the later parts of the 20th century saw that a conflict in single geography definitely impacted a broader geography. 9-11 is the good testimony of what I'm saying. So basically, I think it's time for the region to come together to have a solution for Afghanistan. That's going to benefit the broader region. But of course, that's, that will settle the Afghan conflict for at least some time to allow the peace board building process and nation building process. Thank you very much. Um, at this time, uh, yeah, I want to extend my thanks as well to Ambassador Samad, Ambassador Khan, Mr. Machidi, to Mr. Rahim and Mr. Kriga. It was my pleasure to uh, be your moderator today and uh, I'll give it now to uh, Lucas. Yeah, so thank you, Philip, for moderating the discussion and obviously thank you to all our panelists for participating. And now is the time for our viewers to ask questions to our guests. And as I can already see, a few of you uh, already put your names on the list. So uh, Eike will start to uh, moderate the Q&A now and uh, he will explain to you the structure 
uh, and how it will go from now on. Yeah, thank you very much, Lucas. Um, and also from my side, I would like to express my thanks to our panelists for taking the time to discuss with us today. The next part, as uh, Lucas already said, will be the Q&A. And um, as already announced uh, in the beginning and in the chat, we are keeping a speaker list. To sign up to the speakers list, just write your name in the chat and I will go through it uh, bit by bit. And when I call your name, please open your microphone and feel free to also turn on your camera if you haven't done so already so that our panelists can see you. Um, please phrase your questions as succinctly as you can so that we may ask as many questions as possible and please indicate to whom it is addressed. And the first one uh, on the speakers list is Mazai Zari. I apologize if I mispronounced your name. Actually, actually you did. It's uh, All right, very it's, good. It's Masi Zori, but uh, anyways, uh, thank you to the organizers and thank you also to the panelists. It was really interesting remarks. Um, uh, I give you a little backstory. I myself are also from Afghanistan. My parents uh, fled uh, from Afghanistan in the beginning of the 90s um, to Germany. And I'm now uh, talking to you from Berlin. Um, so um, the Afghan diaspora is in Germany grew the past years uh, and we have now approximately 260 to 280,000 uh, Afghan diaspora in Germany and my, my interest is um, because the Afghan diaspora worldwide is also one of the biggest um, uh, referring to Mr. Krüger and also to Ambassador Samad um, first um, do you see a role the Afghan diaspora can play in, uh, in the peace process? And if so, what role do you see? And to give you a little bit more backstory, we, um, two years ago, um, some civil society activists with an Afghan background um, started a process to sit together and to build an umbrella organization for all uh, civil society actors, which concluded uh, in August uh, 2020, uh, successfully concluded, uh, so as to speak, um, uh, um, and it's also one of the very few umbrella organizations Af the Afghan diaspora has at the moment. And uh, it would interest me what the, uh, the two panelists would say to the, um, yeah, to the positions and, and the intake the, the diaspora organizations can give. Thank you. Uh, shall we start with Mr. Kruger? Sure. Uh, well, uh... Happy to see another Berliner uh, here uh, on the panel. Uh, um, I actually, I mean, if I inter interject that, um, I see with some concerns that so far it's a very male dominated discussion, but I hope this will change over the course uh, of the next uh, uh, people who ask questions. Um, uh, because, I mean, you know, uh, since we always, uh, especially to the Taliban side, not only, but also especially the Taliban side, you know, talk about the importance of uh, women's rights, but also, you know, women's participation uh, in society, um, it's a little bit of a paradox uh, then that uh, we are here in a very, how should I say, male, uh, old-fashioned kind of male club. But anyway, um, to come to your, to your question, um, uh, and 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 uh, so I think there are two ways you can contribute. I mean, many people living in uh, Germany now of Afghan descent are German citizens. Um, so uh, you know you can uh, vote, you can uh, uh, um, influence parties, you can talk with parliamentarians. Also in Germany, you can inform the German um, the German uh, uh, public. Um, uh, you know, and I think as, as people from Afghan descent have a very uh, special connection, obviously, to Afghanistan, um, I think, therefore, uh, I think your voice also in the public debate has a special uh, resonance uh, also just within Germany as German citizens uh, and, and, and people living in Germany and, and, and you know, co patriots so to speak. Um, secondly, um, of course, uh, your expertise often, uh, you know, we work uh, with many uh, Afghans uh, or people of Afghan descent um, uh, when, we, when we, you know, work uh, with Afghanistan 
also who now happen to be uh, living in Germany, uh, being German citizens. Um, you might know, for example, that um, uh, the Berghoff Foundation um, is, is active in uh, supporting the, the peace process and, and uh, several colleagues there um, are also of, of Afghan descent. And uh, so there's a very close um, uh, cooperation. Uh, so, um, but that also goes to other, other uh, uh, endeavors. Um, having said all that, I think there's, a, there's also a certain, um, there's a certain limitation. When we repeat over and over again that this process uh, the, the intra-Afghan negotiations uh, should be and only can be Afghan-owned and Afghan-led, it implies that the two sides who are talking with each other are the representatives of the Republic and of the, of the people fighting against the Republic, the Taliban. Um, so, uh, therefore, uh, the Republic decides whom they're going to send to the negotiations and the Taliban decide whom they're going to send to the negotiations. That's not our thing to decide. Um, and um, therefore, uh, we cannot, for example, say, well, you know, you might think that this or that person is wonderfully qualified, but we know this other person in Germany who, you know, uh, et cetera, et cetera. That would be an interference and it would not be productive. Uh, so um, uh, as members of civil society, as German citizens, as uh, participants in uh, a cooperation project, I think there are many ways to influence uh, uh, what's happening. Um, in, but uh, who then participates in the actual negotiations uh, that, for example, are taking place in Doha and might now have a chapter or not in Istanbul or wherever else on this planet, um, that's for the two sides and their uh, representations to, to decide. Thank you. Thank you. Now I would like to turn it over to Ambassador Samad. I will be very quick so others can ask their questions. Uh, I agree with all, all that was said. Uh, I myself was part of diaspora uh, for 20 years. I was involved with Afghanistan issues since 1980 until I went back. Then I was part of the Republic, as it's called. Uh, and um, uh, there, are, there are different ways you can remain engaged and, and, and play a role. Within Germany, you have to see how uh, and where uh, and in what form and shape you can play a role, depending on your interests. Uh, number two, uh, very much depends on uh, your profession and uh, or as a student, what you're studying. If you're interested in medicine or agriculture or politics or journalism or anything, maybe you can pursue a track that is professionally uh, uh, framed uh, in regards to Afghanistan in Germany or in regards to Afghanistan. But at the same time, uh, you know, as either Afghan born or, or your parents are Afghan born, you also have the opportunity to play a role inside Afghanistan because you will always be considered as a citizen of Afghanistan, regardless of your second citizenship. Uh, so for those, and many have, who have decided to play a role inside the country, uh, obviously hoping that there will be more stability in, in a peaceful environment that would allow for uh, professional Afghans coming from overseas to pay a role. Then there's obviously there are a lot of things that have to do with investment, that have to do with business, that have to do with trade. And so uh, there are so many ways uh, people can be involved. But the first thing that I would say to do is to remain informed and remain engaged and connected. I think those are very important. important. Thank you very much. Next on the speakers list is Nassar. And just as a reminder, please formulate your questions briefly. Nassar, are you still with us? Otherwise, I would uh, give it to Zalam Momand. Hi, yes, can you hear me? Yeah. Okay. Wonderful. Okay, thank you, first of all, to all the panelists today for this conversation that is, I think, very relevant and important and the Hurdy School of Diplomacy Club for arranging this. I have a question mainly for um, Mr. Samad, but um, anyone can chime in. So 
we were talking just uh, previously, Mr. Kluga mentioned that negotiations need to have representatives of both Afghan sides really to negotiate. And yet we have seen last year um, leading up to the Doha agreement, the Afghan government was neither included nor consulted. And some would argue that this de delegitimized the Afghan government, which I think already struggled with legitimacy, but all the more. And this government is supposed to be the political embodiment of the Afghan people. And at the same time, the same past two years, we've seen a drastic uptake in violence committed by the Taliban. And in fact, it seems as though they're empowered by that and therefore committing such targeted attacks against people within the civil society, journalists, um, and so on. So, so looking back, is this approach something that was a mistake or what are the justifications for neglecting the government um, in this process? Um, as far as I know, uh, the government is not totally ignored. Uh, the government uh, uh, of Mr. Ghani uh, it has been kept um, informed, uh, briefed uh, all along. Uh, obviously, uh, the international community considers it as, as a stakeholder. But let's go back to the origin here. Uh, the, the, prob the, the problem was once the Americans decided after 18, 19 years of trying that they wanted to uh, discuss. They did propose to the Taliban that this should be a more comprehensive discussion. Uh, the Taliban would not agree to that. Uh, uh, their logic and reasoning was, you are an occupying force. This is the Taliban speaking. And the government there is not a representative government. It is your uh, puppet government, basically. This is, this is exactly how they put it to the Americans. And the Americans kept saying, well, whatever it is, they need to be at the table. The Taliban said, we are not going to talk to you, and we're not going to negotiate with you, unless you talk to us because you are our adversary. And therefore, you, uh, the Americans had no options left but to discuss it and then leave the door open at some point for the Afghan government and the other political actors. And remember, it's not just the Afghan government. It's also many other political actors in Afghanistan who uh, have to be at the table as well, including civil society, including victims of war representatives. So... I think that this is how it started, and it led to a point where the Americans and the Taliban had to agree to a, an end to war and an end to the American presence in Afghanistan in order for the Taliban to then turn and say, now, once this is done, we want to sit down with the other Afghans and think about the future and talk about how we are going to resolve the issue. Now, the Taliban have resorted to violence. Uh, the government has resorted to violence. Every day we see examples of this. The Taliban have resorted to targeted attacks. Uh, others have also done the same. Uh, the, it's a very messy situation. We need to put all our efforts into reducing violence, into uh, building trust, into engaging in CBM and confidence building measures to reduce the level of violence so that the Afghan people are not hurt whether they are in the village or whether they're in the, in the cities, whether they are educated or whether they're uneducated, whether they're part of the elite or whether they're part of the, you know, of normal citizens who in the middle of the night are being harassed. So we have a big problem that needs to be addressed fairly and equally and equitably. We cannot, you know, play games with this because they're all Afghans and they're all citizens of the country who have rights that have to be equal and they have to be treated the same, whether it's by the Taliban or by the government or anybody else. Because earlier I spoke about spoilers. Some people don't like the word spoilers, but uh, even Germany had to deal with spoilers during World War II. And, and countries have to deal with spoilers. And the reality of Afghanistan is, because of its geography, because of the, the geopolitics, because of 43 years of war, we have domestic spoilers and we have external spoilers. And so one of the problems that we are facing is how to mitigate that and how to Make sure that we do not uh, give them, uh, uh, you know, the, the opportunity to mess up a chance for stability and peace in Afghanistan. Thank you. Mr. Kruger, do you want to add anything to Ambassador Samad? Well, uh, not really. Uh, uh, 
but uh, since the question wasn't really directed at me, uh, and I spoke a lot already, but the uh, just one point, I think uh, one has to differentiate, I think, uh, between um, President uh, Trump and the negotiation team also from the US side. As I think it emerges clearer and clearer, um, President Trump uh, was very inclined to uh, move out troops out of Afghanistan even much faster than, than it is happening now. So I think for uh, Ambassador Khalizad and his team, uh, the question emerged, okay, um, should we just, you know, uh, what can we do under these very difficult circumstances? Um, and they came up with this agreement that uh, I think probably our US colleagues also would agree is not perfect, but uh, at least uh, gave the uh, opportunity for an intra Afghan negotiations. So, you know, if I would be an historian, I, one probably could write a book about, you know, opportunities missed uh, also during the Obama administration to actually. Uh, move forward uh, on, on peace negotiations, um, but we are where we are. I think what emerged, and I think that's actually something quite interesting, is that uh, then after September uh, the 12th last year, uh, both sides uh, learned to some extent, limited extent, but to some extent, to uh, talk with each other about very complex and difficult issues. Yes, the Taliban still maintain that, you know, the Kabul administration, as they call it, you know, is not a legitimate government, da, 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 da. Uh, however, the reality is they sit together with representatives of that government, other representatives of the whole political spectrum of the Republic, and are talking about uh, very uh, complex issues. Uh, so, I think there's also now on the Taliban side uh, a, a certain divergence between the political rhetoric and and the and 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 the and the and the practice. And uh, the Taliban say they want to continue the negotiations after Eid, after the end of Ramadan. Um, and I think there, um, all the actors in the in the region, also especially our. Um, our partners in Pakistan have a big responsibility in uh, in uh, making sure that this is actually going to happen. Thank you. Next on our speakers list is Mariam Laley. Thank you very much. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Yes. Okay, great. Um, well, thank you all for this amazing panel. Um, I also, I know Mr. Kruger said this earlier, but um, I want to also point out that it would have been great to have an Afghan women's voice on this panel, um, and I hope that happens in the future, or any female member on this panel, that would be great. Um, I believe some of my questions have already been answered, but I wanted to go back and just get a little bit of a more specific answer, if possible, for all of you on the panel, um, and particularly those who are representing um, countries outside of Afghanistan. How exactly are you planning to reassure that the political will and that dialogue, the inter-Afghan dialogue that we have been talking about is actually taking place? And um, how are you assuring, particularly for women and minority voices to be present and to be represented. As uh, Ambassador Samad mentioned, there's a lot of diversity and a lot of different voices within the, um, within the Afghan civil society. How are you as representatives of these countries uh, ensuring that that actually happens? Thank you for the question. Um, maybe Mr. Rahim could start on that. Mr. Rahim, are you still with us? Otherwise, I would like to ask Ambassador Khan. 
Okay, so <clears throat> I've just said, you know, Pakistan position has been quite explicit and this is not just declaratory, it is also operational. Now, declaratory, I meant that we feel that there is no military solution in Afghanistan and that there should be a dialogue. And for that reason, we have facilitated as a consequence of which you have the uh, Doha peace accord between the Americans and the Taliban. And thereafter, uh, we have been urging the Taliban uh, to get in uh, to a dialogue with the uh, Afghan uh, regime and then uh, proceed in order to reduce the violence, ideally to have a ceasefire, transitional government and so on and so forth. We have been working to that and, and I think to a certain extent we have been successful in that. We have had a dialogue between the two from September 2020 till uh, uh, recently. Uh, at the, uh, again, uh, uh, the scene has now shifted to uh, Turkey and in Istanbul, uh, the conference had to be postponed because the Taliban were not willing to participate. It will be our uh, total endeavor to get the Taliban on board, to get the Taliban to participate in the uh, Istanbul uh, conference and at the same time we would and again I'm not speaking on for the government of Pakistan but I presume that we would be urging the international community that as these talks go forward if there is uh, uh, progress in these talks then there should also be progress in uh, getting the Taliban into the international mainstream. So I suppose this would be the uh, road map. Uh, it is certainly not in our interest, in the interest of Pakistan, that there should continue to be violence and upheaval in Afghanistan. We want the Afghan, millions of Afghan refugees who are in Pakistan to go back with peace and honor uh, to their homeland. Okay. Thank you. As it is already uh, 7.25, I would now just like to ask Mr. Machichicha, Machichicha uh, on his opinion on that. Uh, you know, uh, I think that uh, Taliban uh, still continue to bargain. So they're trying to, in exchange for their participation in the Istanbul conference, to agree on the release of the imprisoned Taliban and uh, on the elimination of the UN sanctions list. And it seems so uh, that uh, in exchange uh, for a ceasefire, it may be possible uh, may, for example, a permanent ceasefire, I mean, it may be possible for the government to release the Taliban from prison. So uh, we don't know. But uh, the main problem is between Taliban and the government, it's a lack of uh, confidence, you know, they don't trust each other. I, I, I spoke, I remember I spoke in Kabul with uh, reconciled Taliban. Uh, who are living in Kabul, and uh, they said that they don't trust the Taliban movement because they have, of course, contacts with Taliban movement still. And uh, they said that they don't trust the government, that they will be cheated by the government. And that's why, the, and this is a big problem. Thank you. To wrap things up, we now have one more comment from Yuri uh, Leilitin. Are you? Oh, there you are. Good, good evening. Good evening. Uh, thanks uh, for the invitation. I have a question to all, all of the speakers, and I want uh, to know your attitude to my statement. As for Afghanistan, I think it is difficult to say Afghans won or were defeated. Over, the, over 20 years. As Andreas Kruger says, there were many achievements, but there were a lot of failures too. One of the failures is the following. Afghanistan had an unstable political system and a weak state before. 
Su it has it now. The attempt to apply the Western model to the Afghan story proved to be failed. The political model does not work well. In particular, we see that every presidential election results in a severe political crisis. Meanwhile, Western experts, including Russian ones, believe that the Afghans should be governed, should be controlled. However, I think that is not the case. At home, Afghans are better at doing things uh, than outsiders. I think the Afghans need more self-sufficiency. We should let them do their work themselves, build the state they want by themselves. And the foreign's job is to help them to get together. I think that the Afghan society, the politicians will be used traditional uh, institutions, such as Jirgaz, elders, and so on. Because you know, all peoples in Afghanistan except Tajiks continue to maintain tribal structure. We need some kind of political model like the Lebanese one. And I see, I think that nothing has been done in this sphere over the past 20 years. Uh, what do you think about it? Okay, thank you. As we are almost out of time, I would just now like to ask in the round uh, if anyone wants to respond to that in two or three sentences. Ambassador Samad. Yeah. Uh, I, I, I appreciate the, the comment. I think we have almost a hundred years of experience in different types of political order experimentation in Afghanistan from absolute monarchy to constitutional monarchy to an authoritarian regime to a Marxist-Leninist regime to a Islamist regime to an extreme Islamist regime to a reborn semi-democratic regime. We have experienced a lot in the past 50 years alone. And I think we need, we have a lot of lessons that we need to draw from this as a nation and as a nation of diverse community as well with hopefully equal rights between men and women, all other communities. And I hope that this peace settlement, this political settlement that we are aiming for will get us to the point where we all will agree to a political order, economic and social order that works best for Afghans and that Afghans can own and can Afghans can manage and that Afghans can also implement. I, I think that that is an opportunity that I'm looking forward to and, uh, and we need to do everything possible. It's not gonna be perfect. It's not gonna be, it's not gonna satisfy everyone. But at the end of the day, it's the uh, majority of Afghans who have to uh, agree to it and they have to somehow put a stamp of approval to, on it. Thank you. Um, now I would give it to Mr. Rahim for uh, the last words from the panel today. Yeah, basically, I wanted to react to the comments as well. Uh, I think uh, Mr. Samad uh, talked about one side of it, but then don't forget that Afghanistan have been through a protracted conflict with, with a lot of regional dynamics and a lot of regional stake in it. And I think in the light of that, there is significantly, uh, there, there is a need for a regional support to the whole peace process. And uh, for that, the countries of the region will have to come forward and help the Afghans out. I mean, yes, Jirgas, we have, we have traditional systems that can work. And the Afghan society has the capacity to embrace each other after a lot of, all of this uh, destruction and infighting. But then, you know, we cannot uh, disregard the regional dynamics of that. And for that, we need the helping hand not only for Afghans, but for the whole region. Personally, I've always believed that we have a lot of complementarities amongst each other, the countries of the region, some with more leverage than uh, others, but then we can contribute to the, uh, uh, to the development of the entire region together. And for that to happen, 
there is really needed the helping hand of the regional actors. Uh, so yes, uh, we, 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 we have the capacity internally, but let's not, not, not disregard the support that is needed from the outside. Uh, that's definitely going to contribute to this uh, long-term stability of Afghanistan and may contribute to the overall stability of the region, which have been uh, facing the menace of extremism and radical um, radical ideas that have been challenging the stability of the some of the countries in the region. Thank you very much. And that concludes today's Q&A. Uh, for the closing remarks, I would now like to hand over to Lucas once again. Yeah, thank you. So yeah, unfortunately, all good things have to come to an end. And so also this panel ends now. And uh, in the name of the Hertie School Diplomacy Club, I want to uh, thank all our guests for the fascinating discussion. So I feel like we had a very interesting time and uh, we touched upon several relevant topics. And uh, we probably all learned quite a lot today and have a better understanding, uh, not only of the past situation in Afghanistan, but also of the present and the future, thanks to all the great insights the panelists shared with us. So uh, for now, for most of us, at least, uh, it's probably going to be wait and see in order to uh, find out uh, how Afghanistan is uh, going to evolve in the years to come. Uh, but before we end the meeting, uh, I want to inform you that our club is also working on other events. So they're not totally ready yet. But uh, if you want to stay informed of our events in the future and uh, maybe want to join them, uh, you can follow us on uh, LinkedIn or Instagram. And we'll post uh, the links in the chat now. And yeah, once again, thank you for everyone. And I wish you a good evening and a good night.